One thing uh, we started last year, and I'd like to uh, uh, repeat it again this year, is all these lovely people came here on their own dime, and I'd like to give them a few minutes to uh, either talk about their latest project or something that uh, they find interesting or just something they want to talk about. So, Alan, you're down at the end. Uh... I got my MBA from Kellogg back in 1982, and, you know, I went to school to learn how to beat the market, and along came Bert Malkiel's random walk down Wall Street. And, you know, Thomas French is a little new in investing since then, but behavioral finance is a subject that uh, really excites me. I don't know how I graduated thinking I was a logical, rational being, but I'm using hindsight bias uh, uh, to see that. Um, projects, I'm just starting. Write, writing the book was the hardest thing I ever did. I'm a math <coughs> Um, and Bill Falloon, who I guess is not here, um, giving me a contract with a due date and provided the discipline to um, do it. Uh, I'm just starting to get the itch for a, uh, a second book, which would be a little bit broader than investing and include you know, all the aspects of financial planning from um, taxes, uh, estate planning, budgeting, um, in, in kind of some simple terms. and. It would be called something like Roth's Rules of Common Sense, because common sense is not really all that common. Um, you know, uh, just a couple of philosophical uh, musings. Um, I, I considered myself unbelievably uh, lucky I didn't have to. You know, I paid $1,550 a year for my medical school tuition, uh, and my graduate school I got for free. Uh, and then I started working in 1980 and got to sock away some obscene amount of money with the, the, the pension rules and then got these, you know, uh, security returns in the 80s and 90s that were just beyond belief. And I sort of felt sorry for, you know, until very recently for the kids who, you know, were dealing, you know, with, with, with you know, coming out with enormous amounts of debt from school and with overvalued securities to, to buy into their, you know, their retirement plans. And I sort of... I almost felt guilty uh, about it, but now I don't feel so guilty. Uh, I think that you know, someone who was 25 or 35 years old who was socking away money again is going to get some, you know, more than agreeable returns, perhaps the kinds of returns that I got. I mean, good grief, in 1981 you could get 13% CDs, you know, which had a real rate of return of 9% or 8%. Um, in terms of you know, where I'm going and what I'm doing, I'm always writing. Um, I'm always trying to be on the steep part of the learning curve, and I've got to, I think I've explained to a lot of you, I've got a uh, project that I'm working on on communications technology um, and, uh, and politics and political power. It's about nine, the rough's about 93% done, and uh, hopefully it'll be out next year. As far as financial publishing, I don't have any great plans. I'm, I'm thinking of doing some e-publishing, just, uh, just you know, pre putting out Kindle books on my own. Uh, maybe not even books. I mean, you know, somebody explained to me several weeks ago a book is a social contract. It is becoming a social construct. Uh, and, you know, there's no reason why you can't sell uh, 10,000 words for, you know, for $2 as easily as you can sell 100,000 words for $25. Uh, so I may wind up doing little trips and drabs of, you know, encapsulated subjects and doing it that way. You know, buy the ones you want and leave the ones you don't want. Uh, is Mike Piper still here? Mike, are you still in the audience? Where are you? Oh, he had to leave. Too bad. Okay, well, good. I can say this without him being here and embarrassing him. He, Mike is 27 years old, and he is the future of our organization. Him and others like him. There's some other posters on our uh, Vogel Heads board who are in their 20s, their mid 20s, and they are uh, dynamo out there, gung ho Vogel Heads who are helping to spread the word to their um, group. And, and Mike is unusual. The first time I read something that Mike wrote, I thought he was in his mid-40s or, or 50s, even in his 60s, who had been retired. And he turns out to be, had been about 25 at the time. Mike is uh, doing what Bill is talking about. He's publishing small books. And he's uh, getting, um, you know, getting, he's financing his, uh, this is how, this is his living, selling his books. But, um, the way he's doing it, he's using the internet and the, and the, and the median of 
the young folks, if you will, to get the message out about the bulletin. It's not unlike what we're trying to do on the board, but just taking it to three or four or five or 25 different levels. Uh, I, I was at the pleasure of being a, at a financial bloggers conference, the very first one that they had a couple of weeks ago. And there was all these 20-somethings out there, and they're all networking and interconnected and, and doing all this thing, and Mike is in the middle of all that spreading the bogelhead message. And so he's the future, and the young people of the future are the bogleheads, and if he was here, I would have recognized him. And uh, he's got the right idea with, with small books, and I think Bill has realized that, and uh, I've realized that. And uh, the projects that I might be working on in the future are just going to be, if I was going to have a 300-page book, I'd just break it down into three or four uh, uh, 60 to 80-page e-books and you know, sell them for what I'm going to sell them for. But in order to try to spread the boglehead message, you know, we're doing, uh, Wiki is, is fantastic. I don't know if you had a chance to look at what, what we're doing out there with, uh, with, uh, with, with Wiki. It's, it's wonderful in, in what, what they're doing. And, uh, and now we're on Facebook. And, and now we've got people like uh, Mike Piper out there spreading the word to the young community. I mean, this, this, is, this is the future of the Bogleheads. This is spreading the message. And uh, you know, e-technology, if you will, is, is one way of doing it. And I, I plan to, to do what I can. Uh, so that, you know, that, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what I'm doing. And I just wanted to give credit to the, to the young folks that are here today that are, say, under the age of 40, because I mean, you are the future of the Bogleheads. I'll second the endorsement of the wiki site. I did, just before coming here, I sent a message to some of my colleagues at Morningstar.com saying that what you all have done there, I think, is, has evolved into the most useful, deep uh, resource for personal finance on the web. So I just think it's an extraordinary achievement. I'm sure it'll continue to grow and um, get even deeper and broader, but uh, what you've done so far is, is absolutely tremendous. I'm honored to be here, honored to be up on this panel. Um, uh, as Mel's intro of me alluded to, I spent most of my career at Morningstar focusing on mutual funds and helping people select mutual funds. And the longer I did that, the longer I became convinced that we were just sort of toiling in the margins of people's financial lives. So whether they um, selected the right large growth fund or, or whatever they did, really paled in comparison to did they save enough? Did they make semi-sane asset allocation decisions? Did they not completely undermine their financial plan by selling everything at the wrong moment? So I'm really happy in my current role to be able to address a lot of these things um, to tap resources like a lot of you and, and external resources and write about a whole lot of topics. I write about four or five columns a week and am really busy, um, but tremendously enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I have become more and more interested in the logistics of retirement planning, so have been writing an awful lot about that. Um, another topic that's of tremendous interest to me is the decline in cognitive functioning as people age and how they must prepare their financial plans for that possibility. Um, I know that many of us have experienced that in our own families. I'm undergoing that right now with my dad, so it's become front and center with me. And thankfully, he has me to help him, but a lot of other um, elderly folks do not. So that has become a real cause of mine, helping people even dedicated do-it-yourselfers who have been very effective over their lives, helping them prepare for that day that they may not be able to do so. So um, I've been focusing a lot on that. It's a sensitive topic. I know that some users have um, gotten a little offended by things that I've written, but I, I, I mean well, and I think it's a really important and critically under-discussed topic. Could I just uh, ask that, that we recognize once again uh, all of the people who are in the infrastructure of the bogleheads, if the wiki, and Alex, and you stand up, and whoever else is here who are involved in the actual what goes on in the back. Once every ten minutes, and, and, and if you don't weed it, 
um, it, it very quickly becomes un, uninhabitable, and the people uh, on, on the, uh, uh, the, the discussion board who do that really deserve my gratitude. Well, uh, Rick and uh, uh, Christine both uh, talked about the wiki, and I think that's probably one of the most underutilized uh, uh, and unrecognized resources available, and it is a vast, vast uh, knowledge uh, base. So I've been using the bully pulpit of Forbes to uh, do a series on the uh, wiki to try to get uh, uh, more recognition for it. And that's one of the nice things. I, I really uh, don't like having a deadline. And I told Christine earlier that she's my idol. I don't know how she does it, batting out column after column after column. Every time I log on the Morning Star, there's Christine with a new column. And uh, Laura and I share a column that is a bi-weekly column, which means Laura writes one week, and then two weeks later I have to write, which means I'm writing one column a month. And here's Christine Benton out <laughs> what seems like one a day, so I really don't know how you do it. But uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, writing a book is a lot of work. Writing columns are a lot of work, especially when you're supposed to be retired and playing golf and things like that. But uh, I figured, I felt that I, you know, we were, we were given a, uh, a column at Forbes, and we, it gives us a choice to spread the book heads word to a lot of people who aren't really getting the, the bullhead message. So even though it's a chore, I feel that it's, uh, it's worth the effort, and uh, uh, that's basically uh, uh, the, the thing that I love to hate, uh, having a deadline, because I thought I packed that in years ago. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, so Alex. I just want to say something about the wiki. It, it, what's looking at how people are using the study, what's interesting phenomena is um, the regular posters, readers, tend not to use the wiki that much. However, uh, in the, the way the, the internet works, we're getting more and more traffic from people who've never been to the site and they do a Google search on something. And, and basically, the more uh, sort of complex the query or you know, the, the, something like non-deductible IRA tend, is leading people to the wiki. So. Um, like anything on the internet, if the quality is there, the content is there, it eventually gets failed. So there's getting more and more traffic on it. Um, so it may not be seen as much on the on the from the on the forum part of it. And we've talked. We're going to be doing something to figure out a way to better uh, integrate the two, or at least you know put make people more aware of it from there, who the regular users. But people are you know there is a lot of activity. Uh, from people reading the stuff. It's just not as visible. Well, that's great. Now we'll get back to the Q&A. Uh, a question from Alex. What about low-cost variable annuities for someone like Vanguard or uh, TIA crap to fill out any income gaps in retirement? So you're talking about a variable annuity instead of a, uh, uh, instead of a speeder, right? I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, I'm not sure what the role of the variable annuity in retirement is. That's a hard one. Um, I think for certain investors in the saving phase, uh, that a very a low cost variable annuity can be useful. Uh, and here are my criteria for using one. First of all, the person should be young because the compounding advantages of an annuity uh, are greater the longer you are. So the perfect candidate for an annuity is actually one who's 15 years old. <laughs> can we can we stop right there for a second? We want to make sure he's talking about uh, non-qualified annuities, not qualified annuities. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and so the second criteria is you don't have any space for sheltered assets anywhere else. So you don't have enough in your in your IRAs and in your 401s, okay? If you've got plenty of room in there, you certainly don't need a variable annuity. The third thing is it has to be in an asset class which is inherently very tax inefficient, okay? And that's junk and that's REITs, all right? So if you can meet those three criteria, I think that owning a variable annuity uh, is a reasonable thing to do. 
but very few people meet that criteria. A low cost variable in this. Yeah, low cost one. Of course, low cost is part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I would say almost always no. Uh, you're converting uh, a tax efficient long term capital no, gain. I'm saying in retirement, not. Oh, oh, in a retirement? Yes. So you so want tax deferral who, within a tax? No, it's people who just need an income stream that is greater than 3% or 4% and don't really care about leaving. Uh, well, ac actually, it, it could work to leave some money to, towards an heirs. If there's a low-cost variable annuity, um, you could guarantee yourself that 5% stream in, in retirement and still leave something for your heirs, but you're going to have costs that make, generally speaking, a, um, the, the average mutual fund look cheap. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's why I asked specifically about TIA Crafty and Vanguard. I mean, I, I, might, I know there's a lot of professors, and my parents are among them, who are living off of these sorts of, of things. And with, uh, you know, with withdrawal rates that they couldn't have if they were to follow, you know, 3% or 3.5% or something, you know. But what are they invested in, Alex? Well, it's like TIA Craft. No, but I, I mean, what specifically? Yeah, yeah traditional, um, and you know, like, um, say, I don't know what it is, maybe seventy percent TIA traditional, thirty percent craft stock. Yeah. yeah, but TIA craft is kind of a different animal. I mean, they've structured their private portfolio to be yeah, but TIA craft is kind of a different animal. I mean, they've structured their product inside an annuity, but it's not what I think of when I think of a variable annuity. And I use Vanguard variable annuities all the time, but as a ten thirty five to get into something ugly into something, you know, much, right. much, much less ugly, but still not great. Yeah, the, the TH tradition, by the way, until about eight months ago, was an amazing deal uh, because you, if, you, if, you, if you qualified for it, and it means that you had to have received some money at some point in your life from an educational or a public institution, which you know, probably 90% of people would qualify for, and it basically you had a, what amounted to a money market that yielded, that yielded and still does yield, 3%. And all you had to do is put it inside of an IRA, and the money was perfectly liquid in and out. I contacted Vanguard, and in my question to the Vanguard people last night was on the variable annuity side. Because, and we're not going to talk politics or anything here, but if taxes on long term capital gains go up to an ordinary income tax rate, and taxes on dividends from stock goes up, go up to an ordinary income tax rate, that all of a sudden, the Vanguard variable annuity becomes very attractive on a, uh, for taxable accounts. And uh, we've been talking with Vanguard for the last year and a half, when it looked like this could occur, uh, could occur, not saying it will, but it could, about uh, how we can structure using, how we can manage accounts at our company. Uh, using Vanguard variable annuities, because right now there's no system at Vanguard to allow money managers to actually manage portfolios of variable annuities in a very efficient way, and rather than calling up individually and talking with somebody on the phone and trying to manage 500 client portfolios, like making 500 individual phone calls, I mean, it doesn't work. So they're working on the system to allow investment advisors like us to be able to efficiently manage variable annuities just like we can manage Vanguard funds, uh, and, uh, and I think it's an important step in, if uh, the tax laws change that would make very low-cost, very low-annuity products particularly attractive in, uh, in a lot of asset classes where right now they're not. And one, and one other thing that uh, hasn't been touched on, but in, in, a, in a lot of states, uh, variable annuities are uh, sheltered from predators. So. There are some people like that are subject to lawsuits that might consider it uh, doctors uh, and others who uh, are subject to lawsuits. Uh, this is a question about small cap and value and tilting. Uh, does anyone like to share the thoughts on either yes or no? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. <laughs> okay, there you go. Alan, do you uh, do you do, do you use that in your portfolio? Oh, I was going to actually say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought you were just, I thought you were through. 
No, no, I'm not saying do it. No, I'm saying is that the core portfolio is beta. I mean, it's stocks, bonds, U.S. stocks, some international. I like to use REITs. I call it the core, core portfolio. Very simple. It, it, that gets you, for most people out there, that's, a, that's all you need. I mean, you're there. You're done. Uh, you need maybe something more simple than that, you know. Total global, total bond, you're finished, right? Two, two funds and you're done. And that's better than how 99% of individual investors are investing, just doing that. But as you start to break it out and you start to become more interested in how the markets work and all the different risks that are out there and breaking it apart, you might say, well, I'm going to have a certain portion in the U.S., a certain portion in international, maybe some in emerging markets, maybe some in... You just start to break apart your uh, portfolio a little bit because each of these components have different risks, different returns, and they work differently together in a portfolio, and you might enhance your return. Come to small cap value, in the long run, not all the time, uh, there have been many long-term periods of time, five years, ten years, where small cap value stocks have underperformed the rest of the market. But in the long run, you tend to, they tend to outperform because, I believe, there's more risk in owning small companies, there's more risk in owning value companies like Europe, if you will, we talked about that, than there is in owning the whole broad basket. So, because there's these extra risks out there, you're entitled to an extra return. And if you understand how the markets are broken down, and you decide you want to take these extra risks in your portfolio, then it's just fine to allocate a portion of your portfolio to, say, a small cap U.S. or a small cap international fund. But you knowingly are doing it. I mean, and you're knowingly paying more money for it. This, this doesn't come cheap. You could buy beta, the Vanguard total stock market, for seven basis points, 0.07%. If you venture off from that and you go into small cap value, you're going to pay more money, but the idea is the excess return that you're going to get from the risk premiums make up for, and, and more, make up for the extra costs that you're you're taking, but I think if you venture into this knowing what you're getting into and, and knowing or deciding how much you risk you want to actually allocate to that area. Yeah, I was fascinated to hear Gus Sauter last night talk about this issue, and what I thought I heard him say was, yeah, small value stocks do have higher returns, but I'm not willing to bet the company on it. Uh, and, and he basically came out and admitted that. Um, Rick's exactly right. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it doesn't come cheap. Um, the DFA U.S. Small Value Fund, <coughs> excuse me, has probably captured about half of the small value premium. Uh, the other half of it, I think it's lost transactional costs because maintaining a, a highly tilted small value fund is, very, is fairly expensive in terms of transactional uh, in terms of transactional costs. Um, I, I think that a large part of it is a risk story. We sure as heck saw that um, uh, in you know, 08, 09 with what small value funds did. And you could have had small value funds existed in 1929 to 32, it would have been even worse. Uh, but I think there's also a behavioral component as well to it. Uh, so, you, you know, as long as you can tolerate it and you know what you're doing, your time horizon is long enough. Sure, go for it. Uh, knock yourself out, but but you know if you want to, uh, uh, you know use Rick's core four approach. I think that's wonderful too. Now there's one mutual fund that I would recommend to if you know somebody who has access to it in a four hundred one k plan, which is the DFA sixty forty global portfolio, which is has a fairly nice, healthy tilt to it. It is global. It owns everything: REITs, emerging markets, all that stuff. You know, domestic, it's, it's very balanced. Uh, the bond portion of it is very balanced, and it's one fund. And if you, you know, for the person who doesn't want to think about investing, who wants to use one fund in a 401k, if that one's available, uh, I would not recommend that. I could not recommend that one highly enough if they're willing to bear a bit, a bit of a tilt. I do believe in the Fama French three factor model, but you know, don't lose sight that small cap and value is compensation for additional risk. Bill, you may not completely agree with me on that point. Um, with that said, Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, small cap value is about 3.3% of the total market in the Vanguard style box. So my own portfolio, I have an extra 1% tilt. People that come to me with a portfolio that 50% of their equity is in small cap value, 
in my opinion, that's many times too risky. And one thing I would add is that when we look at the universe of actively managed funds, to the extent that anyone uses them, what we see is that almost across the board, you've got a smaller cap tilt than the broad market, that active managers uh, typically do underweight the index's largest constituents. The, the one thing that I would point out, though, is that if you look at the long historical data plus the live fund data, that a 60-40 conventional portfolio, U.S. stock bond portfolio, has a higher return, has a lower return and a higher risk uh, than a 40-60 small value bond portfolio. Uh, you know, so at least in terms of mean variance preference, you are better off with small value out over the market. Of course, you have to bear this very high tracking risk. You have to be willing to have a negative return in a year like 1998 when, when your neighbors were making 40%. I can make an argument that having more small cap value in a portfolio is, uh, it, it is a good idea if your intent is to more mirror the economy rather than try to mirror the stock market. What I mean by that is half of our economy is not securitized in the form of equity. And that half that's not securitized in the form of equity, most of it are very small companies, which tend to be bought and sold at value stock type prices. So if you want your portfolio to look more like GDP, look more like the US economy, what you would do is you start out with the total stock market and then add or magnify small cap value because that gets your portfolio <coughs> more away from what the stock market is, which is nothing more than companies deciding how they're going to capitalize themselves, towards what the U.S. economy is. It pushes it that direction. And I think that's a good justification for doing it. I think that's a deep and insightful point and one I've not thought about. Uh, no kidding. Before. <laughs> <laughs> such a bad uh, uh, market for investors, you know, as Alan is fond of pointing out, we're, you're back to, we're back to the high water mark if you're a 60-40 portfolio uh, investor, whatever your high water mark was at the end of 19, you know, 2007, November, you know, October 13th, 2007, when the market peaked, if you have a 60-40 conventional portfolio, uh, you're doing just great. But if you're the average American worker, it really sucks. Uh, and the small value tilted portfolio more closely mimics that, so I think it's a, it's a great point. Well, here's a case of where risk showed up. I got a news flash. In these days, when we've all been temporary residents of Pennsylvania, the local news is reporting that Harrisburg, the state capital, has filed for bankruptcy. I don't know whether the Bogleheads had anything to do with that, but. Uh, <laughs> The risk did show up, and uh, the question that uh, is asked, is this a harbinger of a coming domestic crisis, or is this just noise? Well, according to Meredith, it is, it is the future. Okay. But, you know, she's been wrong more than once. Anyway, um, well, I come from Rhode Island. Of course, we had Central Falls, which was the first one to go under, and uh, that, that, of course, is being resolved by the state. I don't know. I mean, it... The states will come in and take over when the cities are no longer able to pay their bills. This is not a ci city, this is the state capital. Oh, this is the city, though. Well, it is a city, city. yes. But so it's the state capital where all the politicians reside. They don't live there. The they don't live there. They're where they spend their time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think no, the states will come in and they will bail out the cities, restructure them, take over management of them, get them back on their feet. It's going to take a while, but it will. And in the, in the case of a state ever going bankrupt, the federal government will step in. So I don't think there's any risk at all to, say, the Vanguard Intermediate Term Municipal Bond Fund, which has thousands of securities in it. I don't think it's going to make any difference at all. That's my opinion. I think it does make a strong case, though, for a fund over individual bonds and for a nationally diversified fund over a single state fund, unless you are in 
a state with very high state tax, and you personally are in a high tax bracket. Yeah. In fact, Bangor does have a long-term Pennsylvania tax free, so I'm sure that that will have some kind of impact on it. I mean, the classic mistake that a lot of small investors do, the older ones, is they'll put all of their money into individual bonds uh, from their own home state, and it's just the classic case of the tax dog, the tax tail, where, you know, and wagging the investment talk. That's an incredibly dumb thing to do. Now I know Alan has some opinions about, <laughs> about, about municipal bonds, so I'll yield to him. For $100, will you say I had a deep, insightful comment? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you have to wait till next year. That's mine, mine this year. Um, I'm a big believer that if you own muni bonds, you want to own it in a diversified fund. I think that I am not Meredith Whitney, but muni bonds scare me. And I think muni bonds have a new risk that they haven't had in the past. Uh, remember the question of the 8% assumption? Mm -hmm. um, well, if muni bonds, or, or municipalities and states have a large unfunded liability using fairly aggressive assumptions. So the purpose of the bond portfolio, in my opinion, <coughs> is mostly to be that as a shock absorber if stocks go down. Now think about it, if stocks do go down significantly, and this is not a prediction, I am not Meredith Whitney, but if stocks have a bad run for the next 10, 15 years, if there are some terrorist events, uh, if um, you know, the country default is going to be greater than they think it is, then those municipalities are going to be under bigger stresses. They're going to have bigger unfunded liabilities. And yes, they can do things to try to cut costs, but remember, you know, these are elected officials and politicians don't generally make the tough decisions. So that in my opinion, and this is not a prediction, this is a consequence of a low probability situation mm -hmm. that if our stock portfolio mm -hmm. goes down, um, defaults in our municipalities could go up just when we really don't want them to happen. So what proportion of a fixed income uh, uh, portfolio should the average person in this audience have in munis? Zero? 20 percent? Oh, that's an easy answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, first of all, you've got to be in the taxable situation where they make sense. You know, the goal is not to pay the least amount of taxes. The goal is to make the most amount after taxes on a risk-adjusted basis. Um, Municipalities are about 8% of the total U.S. Um, bond market, and I would be hesitant to go much above, you know, 12% or so. Now, could we take one more question? Um, this is appropriate for the, this time period. Uh, it's for Dr. Bernstein. Doc, there are a number of threads on the forum about the current state of the bond market and how to invest or avoid it. Previously, I remember you stating that you feel that the risk versus the reward of anything longer than cash in short-term bonds is a fool's errand. The other professionals here basically are championing stay the course with intermediate bonds. Please clarify, if you would, your current thinking on this. Well, as I said to Christine yesterday, I can't be right about everything. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm going to stay the course on my particular recommendation. I mean, the dumbest thing that I could do now would be to capitulate. Uh, because, you know, I, I mean, how much upside is there left in bonds, uh, really, at this point? Uh, so I continue to believe that, and, you know, I think that more important than having an opinion uh, and shifting around uh, uh, is, is simply to stay to stay your course. I've always been a believer that bonds should be short. Uh, in generally, that's in general that's been a terrible strategy for uh, the past thirty years or so. Uh, but I'm reasonably certain that that, that you know that the day will come when that will look like a good strategy again, and I'm going to wait for it. Uh, <laughs> I think in the past you've said you were an asset junkie, Bill. Asset class junkie. Okay, asset class junkie. So this question might be appropriate. It says on gold, Jack recently said that this is speculation. But if you must own it, one, two, three, or even five percent in gold isn't the worst thing you can do. Does the panel agree? 
anyone more accommodating to owner a greater percentage or even making it part of one's strategic asset allocation? Gold was the best investment I ever made. Um, when I graduated college in 1979, I knew everything. And my parents gave me some college graduation money and I bought gold and silver. Even with the recent surge, it has not kept up to inflation. You know, it taught me that I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. Um, I still believe in gold as an asset class, or I actually like the precious metals mining. I wish the Vanguard precious metals mining had not taken in non-precious metals. I think Vanek has a great GDX uh, gold miners ETF. Uh, I think it can make a lot of sense. I think that probably 99% of people who've gotten in there in, in the last uh, two or three years are doing it for performance chasing for just the wrong reasons. So I've been selling as, as it has been going up to, to rebalance. Yeah, I mean, as Jack said yesterday, people discover diversifying asset classes only after they've had high returns. Uh, the day will come when people will no longer be interested in gold, when as in the year 2000 and 1999, uh, all the talking heads said it wasn't part of the portfolio, central banks were selling it, blah, 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 blah. And that'll be the time to put it back in your portfolio. On a long-term mean variance uh, uh, point of view, either gold or precious metals equities uh, will work. I like precious metals equities just because they're easier to handle, they yield a dividend. Uh, I, too, uh, am almost beyond words at what Vanguard did several years ago with the precious metals fund. They always do these things at the wrong time. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this is not the time. Okay, those of you who were here last year will... Yeah, I was going to steal it. <laughs> 30 years ago, I made an investment in gold. It has been a fabulous investment. It has paid wonderful dividends, including three wonderful children. Here's the investment. Right? <laughs> and mine was 53 years ago. <laughs> Just a quick point on the timing question. I had to do a CNBC retirement roundtable a month or so ago, and that was one of the topics they wanted to cover. And actually, the other panelists were pretty bullish on gold. And I, I just stepped back and said, so if you told me that you had some asset that was up 25% on an annualized basis, and you were going to add it to a portfolio to decrease risk in the portfolio, I'd say you were crazy. I wouldn't care what asset it was. And that's what we were looking at with gold returns. So I, um, I believe that it can probably be part of a long-term strategic portfolio, but I agree that the timing is, is awful. As, as, our, as our parents taught us, you know, if, you look, if you're playing poker and you look around the table and you don't know who the patsy is, you are the patsy. And, you know, when you buy gold, you are probably buying it from someone who bought it for $300 an ounce in 1984. Who's the patsy? Jeremy Siegel had in his stocks for the long run, he used to have a chart, I don't know what version or edition he's on right now, but uh, years ago, uh, in stocks for the long run, he had a chart that looked at the price of gold going all the way back to the 1800s. And w there, there were little blips along the way, but it was an adjusted for inflation. The price of gold adjusted for inflation. And although you looked at this chart and there were little blips along the way, uh, during the war times and during the 1980s, uh, 1990s, and, and now we have another blip. But in the long run, the price of gold is the inflation rate. It is the inflation rate. And right now, in my opinion, the price of gold is running way ahead of, where, of inflation. So two things are going to happen. Either the gold bugs are right, and we're going to have terrible inflation, and they might be right, I mean, I don't know if they're going to be right or not, um, or they're wrong, and when everything calms down around the world, and hopefully we fix some of these problems that we have with uh, sovereign debt and such, and our own deficit starts to hopefully reverse, uh, that the price of gold will come back down to the inflation rate, which currently I, I pegged it somewhere around $600 an ounce is where it should be trading at. So, I mean, that's one of those two things are going to happen, I just don't know which. I mean, not only are you brilliant and insightful, but you also know what the intrinsic value of gold is, so I want to compliment you on that. All right, at this time we'd like to do some wrapping up of the, uh, uh, the event, and 
I would be really remiss if I did not recognize the people who helped me pull this off. I have a real all-star staff, and uh, I'd like to call them up and recognize them. Ed Rager, Marlene Lindauer, Paul and Linda Globerson, and Gail. Come on up. because of all of these people and uh, as I said in business I used to delegate and wonder whether the people some people were going to be able to carry out a task and sometimes you spend time chasing after them worrying about whether they were going to get something done with these people I give them an assignment and I cross it off the list because I know it's done and I know it's going to be done properly and these people have really, really worked for the last year. Every, every one of these events takes a year to plan and carry out. Right? <laughs> and now I'd like to recognize the other important people here, and that's you, the attendees. It's really great to see new faces every year, and young new faces, that's really exciting. And it's also nice to see people who return, and we feel like we, we know a lot of these people from two, three, four, five, six events. We have one individual here, Timmy, who's been to all 10 events. So hopefully you've had a good time. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed yourself and uh, learned something and would like to see uh, uh, some of your faces back next year, if not all. I realize that uh, oh, Mel's okay. thanking everybody, but there's a guy who does an unbelievable job, but he, he spends an immense amount of time and he's continuously working on this, and we really, really should thank Mel. Jack had said he'd like to get together with us uh, in a non-resort place, and it turned out that Taylor uh, found out that Jack was speaking at the uh, Miami Herald Making Money Seminar, and he knew that I was a snowbird, so he called up and said, Mel, should we invite, uh, uh, at that time that we were called the Vanguard Diehards, and uh, should we invite the Diehards to uh, come to Miami and have lunch with Jack? And Taylor and I were going to pay for the event, and we said, well, what if the whole world comes? You know, you're on the internet. <laughs> we got to limit this thing somewhere. So we said, okay, $50 a head, 100 people, we'll go for 5000 And uh, that's how we set up the first one, and we thought it was a one-time event. But then so many people wanted to come. It was very short notice. A lot of people couldn't come. But they said, when's the next one? The next one. So, uh, as luck would have it, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, forum members who uh, I did not know and uh, emailed and said, I'm on a forum in Pennsylvania and I'm going to host the event and it's right close to Vanguard and, uh, you know, we'll be able to visit Vanguard. So, that's how the second event came about and then Morningstar was gracious and said, would you guys like to have your next event in conjunction with uh, the Morningstar Conference? So all of a sudden, we went from a one-time event to, and, and later on when we were writing the book, we didn't have time to have an event. Jack said, Mel, when are we going to have the next event? I mean, Jack, Jack really loves this, and it's amazing. And, uh, but we were always trying to tie our events in with uh, another event where Jack was appearing. Jack has a deal with his wife that he's going to be home on the weekends. And uh, so uh, we kept trying to tie it in with the, an event that Jack was speaking at. And we ended up in Denver with the CFA group. And after that, uh, Jack said, 
I'll go wherever you guys want me. And then we broke away and started doing on our doing the things on our own. So what started out as a lunch with Jack in Miami in 1999 has now turned into this, which is our 10th event. So hopefully this will go on for a long time and uh, uh, one of our maybe people in the audience might someday be doing this job so I can go play golf. <laughs> but in the meantime, I love what I do and I love what the people I'm working with. But anyway, thanks for coming. I hope you had a good time and we'll see you all next year.